Hello and welcome to Inside Music, episode number 99. I'm your host, James Shotwell, and we have a fantastic episode for you this week. My guest is none other than Mike McCarran, founder of Punk Out. And if you don't know about Punk Out, you're going to learn about them in this episode, but they are working to make the world a better place for everyone. And I got to tell you a quick story to explain why this episode is happening, but if you've listened to the show in the past, you'll know Mike is no stranger to the show. He did a bit part a few, uh, it was a couple of months ago now, maybe even a year ago, and I wanted to have a longer talk with him and we're finally going to do it but this is why it's happening. A little over a month ago, the world changed forever. The U.S. presidential election came to a close, the results rolled in, and a lot of people felt a lot of different ways. And the first person that came to my mind when all of this was unfolding and all the news was starting to break was Mike, because Mike is helping make the world a better place. He works. He's working towards equality in a scene that has not always kept equality as something that was all that important. He's doing the Lord's work, if you want to say that, but I'm not even sure that that, that's how you would explain it here. He's doing something special. And as the election results rolled in, I realized that his role in the alternative music scene and Punk Out's role in music in general was going to be more important than ever because there was an increased sense of urgency. We have to act. We have to do something. We have to fight to make sure that things stay good and get better from here. We can't go backwards. We've come way too far to start doing that now and anyone that thinks that that's the course that's about to play out has to be shown that they're wrong without being necessarily told that they're wrong you know what i mean you have to find a common ground with people you know you can say that we have to fight and we have to protest and that's true you have to do all of those things you have to stand up for what you believe in but the only way we're going to move forward is if we can first find some common ground and then we can build from there and i think mike and his team at punk out are working to do exactly that In this conversation, Mike and I talk about election night and everything that's come since. We talk about our own interactions since that time and how we both handled things for good or bad. We talk about weddings. We talk about the Warp Tour cruise. We cover a lot of ground here, but at the end of the day, it all comes back to this. It is on each of us as individuals to make this world a better place, and we are stronger in numbers, but if we start thinking about things in an us-against-them kind of way, then nothing gets accomplished. Uh, more, more likely, things get destroyed, and that's not what we want. We want to build towards a better future, and I, I like to think that Mike has helped pioneering a way for that to happen in the alternative music scene that maybe we haven't exactly seen before. Now, before I get to the conversation, I got to tell you a few quick things. For starters, this is episode 99, so next week is episode 100, and we're going to have a very special guest. Holix founder Matt Brown is going to be on the show, and a lot of you have requested this, and I had to beg, but he agreed to do it, so next week, Matt Brown will finally make his debut appearance on the show. Secondly, this show is actually made possible only by Holix, the music industry's leading digital promotional distribution platform. What that means is that Holix helps record labels, independent artists, and more throughout the industry share new and unreleased music with members of the press and radio without fear of piracy. For more information on this and access to a free 30-day trial, visit holix.com. That's H-A-U-L-I-X.com. You should also be following the show on Twitter. It's at Inside Music Pod or at Inside Music P-O-D. We post updates about guests, upcoming shows, tidbits you might have missed, and a whole bunch of news and editorials related to making it in the music business today. Finally, I want you to support Punk Out. They're a nonprofit organization, and any donation you give to them financially is tax deductible. So with taxes right around the corner, you might as well go ahead and give whatever you can to punk out, even if you do it for a selfish reason like having to pay less taxes. I don't care. Mike doesn't care. They need the money to do what they're doing, and they are doing so much good for the world that I hope you'll get behind them and support it. So please please give whatever you can to punk out. And if you don't have money, find a way to volunteer. You know, put on, uh, host some kind of event in your area that been ultimately benefits the causes that they're working towards. You can find more information on their websites and their social feeds, all of which are detailed in this episode. Now I'm going to play a little bit of music. Since Mike's not in a band or uh, part of a record label, I had to pick something. So I chose the opening number from the brand new film La La Land, which I absolutely loved. So here's a quick plug for La La Land. And then we're going to get into the conversation. So sit back and enjoy my conversation with Mike. Sink into our seats right as they dimmed out all the light. 
Of my four favorite sport, or of all, all like the four major sports, it's my least favorite, probably. But really? I have still, yeah, yeah. But I still follow it really closely, mm. um, especially with the Sixers. Especially now that I'm in uh, Baltimore, I like have to pay for everything to watch them, so I feel like way more invested uh, in them because I'm like paying to watch a product that is actively trying to get better, and it's a really cool storyline behind the team itself. Um, so they're a fascinating team to watch. So I, I've been more into them recently than I have in like the last decade since AI left, which was like the saddest moment. Looking back on it, what glorious years. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel that way about uh, the Timberwolves here in Minneapolis because we just lost Kevin Garnett. And uh, now it's kind of like watching a bunch of babies learn how to play a grown man sport. Yeah, and you guys kind of had the same thing too because like, you know, a. Allen Iverson was like the heart and soul of the Sixers when I was growing up and then he left and then he came back for like uh, basically a swan song and Kevin Garnett did that too, right? He came back last year yeah. and played like a swan song year with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. I remember playing you guys in the, uh, in the, the playoffs. I believe the Sixers beat you guys a couple times. Yeah. I call it the, uh, the Kobe effect. The idea that's like, I got to yeah. do like a victory tour of my career. Yeah. Yeah. Except only <laughs> only Kobe can pull it off. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping to do that in my own life one day. Just go on a victory tour somewhere. I was thinking of going back to Cadoba. I worked at a Cadoba, like in college. And I was thinking, I'm just going to go back on a victory tour and work at Cadoba for like a day. Mm. I had a, I had this crappy manager at a local video store that I worked at throughout high school, and I got fired because of some, some crap that wasn't, wasn't true. And every time I pass by there, I feel like going in with my film editor tag from substream and just like slamming a magazine on the counter and being like what <laughs> what now what what now she's probably like dead she's kind of older when i worked there so like she it's now it's like her daughter and i'm just like yeah your mom wronged me <laughs> yeah my, my my comic book like revenge story would not be that exciting <laughs> yeah no I'm neither just, would mine just petty grievances i'm coming back to like carry out on people <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> yeah yeah remember when you were a dick to me when i worked at arby's yeah look now look at me. <laughs> wait you worked at arby's i did my first job was at Arby's. well not my first job uh... my first like uh <clears throat> you know as a teenager and like in the midwest i like worked in cornfields i was a camp counselor for like a christian camp and then i had like what i would call my first like uh, traditional job and that was working at arby's uh mine was uh mine was working at papa john's i worked at that damn papa john's for eight years Oh, I worked at a Mancino's, which is like a Papa John's ripoff. Uh, but okay, okay. Oh, uh, I can only imagine. Papa John's is horrendous. It, it, this place was awful. They were. It was like, it was like a, a clique of late twenty somethings, kind of like managed and ran it, and then they hired a few kids to do all of the work, and I was one of the kids who had to like hang out with their older uh, dreams, have it already been crushed selves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I blame Papa John's for uh, me never wanting to eat fast food pizza again. Um, definitely, definitely. Because you know what, I used to love Pizza Hut, and now ever since working at Papa John's, I can only eat what I would consider the real deal, which is your city corner pizza place. No, I, I feel the same way because uh, anytime I think about ordering from a place like that, I think of uh, or how awful we did it. Anything being like fancy or decent. <laughs> Like just the, the cheap factory line version of making pizza that those places kind of operate on. Oh my god! Yo, f funny story though with that, and then my <laughs> funny story. So the Papa John's that I worked at was right across the street from a Pizza Hut, and it was like this brand new Pizza Hut. And the Papa John's we worked at was in this crappy old building attached to a Rita's Water Ice. Water Ice is really big in Philly. And um, do you guys have Water Ice out in Minneapolis? No. No. Well, you're missing out. Anyway. So across the street is this Pizza Hut, and we ran out of cheese at, at, at Papa John's, and we used to exchange ingredients with the Pizza Hut across the street. 
we would order each other's pizzas. We had actually a pretty healthy relationship. Oh, nice. Papa John would be very disappointed. Um, the pizza place I worked at was connected to the video store I worked at, and for a while I worked at both. So I, so the owner would like offer us food in exchange for like a movie the day before it came out on video because this was back before Netflix. <laughs> so like it mattered. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It mattered if you could get Hitch a day early. <laughs> that's like that was like one of the big movies that came out when i worked there so my go-to punchline for any like movie rental story is hitch and the fact that there was a girl i worked with who didn't like movies she only liked the movie armageddon so every time she worked she would only play armageddon in like the store on the oh movie. my god so i've seen it like 50 times you know how <laughs> do you know do you know that uh the song by aerosmith and armageddon is aerosmith's only number one hit on billboard i did not know that yeah, yeah, you would think. And what a shame, because it's one of their weakest songs. Aerosmith was real good in the 70s. It seems like it's, it, it is a, it's not a great song. That's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it just reminds me of like every prom that I went to, which was pretty horrendous. <laughs> prom, prom season in high school was probably the worst thing on the planet. It's it's one of those things where it's almost like it's hard to believe that those guys wrote that song and were like, "This is good enough to release." Cause I don't think they didn't didn't like Jamie Dimon write that song. Oh, it was like a, one of the sense. big, yeah, one of like the humongous songwriters. It is their most of, the, of song. like the eighties. My my new thing is whenever I I see a band, uh, I see a band that I like, I think of and I'm like, I wonder what their biggest song is. I go to Spotify and I like to look at the numbers, mm -hmm. and that is their biggest song by like. 40 million plays <laughs> yeah that's crazy i've been watching those like they have those billboard montages on the, uh on youtube yeah yeah of like an artist and like listening to some of those and like seeing where all the songs ended up on the rankings was so fascinating <laughs> like I, I had no idea that that lady gaga's bad romance never hit number one you would have fooled me i could i couldn't walk anywhere without hearing that song <laughs> Um, yo, you're absolutely right. Aerosmith did not write that song. Diane Warren wrote that song. She also wrote. Oh, Diane Warren. She also wrote "Music of My Heart." So, you know, yeah, she she really hit like one exact thing. And she wrote "Till It Happens to You" with Lady Gaga. So, I mean, she only oh. writes movie songs. <laughs> oh, weird. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's one of those people that uh, you never hear their name, but they they've written like all yeah. of their favorite songs. Yeah, I uh, wish I. You know what? I I wish that we could uh, see Lady Gaga cover some Aerosmith songs. I think we will. I hope she does that. I hope she does that during the Super Bowl. But think, you know, yeah. The other best Super Bowl other than the Katy Perry Super Bowl, which was like probably the best Super Bowl ever. Um the Aerosmith one with Britney Spears and NSYNC and I think Nelly. Yeah. That one was amazing. That had ever something for everyone. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm I feel like when we inevitably lose Steven Tyler in, I don't know, 20 years because he's going to live longer than most of us, uh, I, Lady Gaga will be the one they turn to. And it's like, oh, we need someone, yeah. we need someone to cover Dream On for the Steven Tyler tribute show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Could you imagine, could you imagine that? But, you, you know, you never know these days. I mean, like, 75 evidently is the new 25 because didn't Mick Jagger just have his, like, eighth kid today? He became a father for the eighth time today. Not only He's 75. Not only did he become a father <laughs> at that age, but his, his new child is younger than his youngest great-grandchild. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? Can we, like... The amount of drugs that he did in like the sixties and seventies and the fact that he's still fertile amazes me. Amazes me. How does that happen? I read a story These that are things like this in my head. It's a it's a workout thing, part of it. I read a story that says he runs he runs three miles every day. Shut up. I run three miles every day, but I'm not <laughs> seventy five. But I mean you know what it feels like when you're done with those three miles at your age. So at 75, yeah, it just yeah. keeps going. Yeah, that's impressive. I don't think I could run three miles uh, in a week. I mean, I, I I walk it on my Fitbit accordingly, but I don't think I could run it. So you're all right. Well, you're more... you know, it, 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 it's settled then. You know, when I have my first kid, I'm going to tell them to grow up like Mick Jagger. Yeah. They're going to have a wonderful life. 
Yeah, just <laughs> just do it. Just go for it. I think it's part of it is that I think he that at least for a long period, I think they lived with like reckless abandon and they never really mm-hmm. worried about it. And the fact that they didn't stress over whether or not what they were doing was good or bad for them, they just kind of piled through it. You know what I mean? They just kind of made their way through. <laughs> I think a lot of what I think a lot of what trips people up is that they like they reach a certain age and then they start worrying like way too much about all that stuff and the stress just kind of eats them alive. But you see Mick Jagger, that guy, he still doesn't look like he gives a like he cares at all. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And you know what? I think I think I speak for the both of us when we say that we want to congratulate Mick Jagger on once again proving that he made the right life choices. Yeah, at this point, I'm just wondering if he, if which one between him and Keith Richards lives longer. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be great. If they don't die, like, simultaneously. Uh, maybe they'll be like those old married couples <laughs> where one dies and the other one dies, like, 48 hours later. And you're like, oh, they were uh, always meant to be together. That's so funny. <laughs> Listen, I have I have a pair of grandparents that are still alive, and one is sick, and one just recently became sicker, and I feel like the, they both started to kind of go downhill simultaneously, and it's sad, but it's also beautiful because you're just like, oh, at least like one of them isn't going to leave the other one behind. They're just like, now nah, you're going down. I guess my body's going to fail now too. <laughs> They're just oh going God. down together. Well, first of all, I I hope your grandparents feel better soon. Second of all, if they do go down, they should go down like that, like that old couple in Titanic. It's the most romantic thing ever. You know, when the like the, the oceans pouring into the Titanic. Yeah, and they just accept it quietly. Yeah, beautifully, beautiful. Yeah. That's not me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out like <laughs> that. James Cameron. <laughs> I want, I want James Cameron to direct my, my death. Mm. Oh, I'm definitely. Sure. I was reading. Um, yeah. I was reading, you know, just like five weeks before he died, Leonard Cohen did some interview where he was like, you know, I, I've had a good life. I think I'm ready for it to wind down now. And then like five weeks later, he dies. And ever since I read that interview and then he died, my brain has been like, I'm never going to be that mm-hmm. guy. If I was Leonard Cohen's age with all that success, I'd still be like, no, I want to live. Damn it. I want to live. <laughs> I've got another 25 <laughs> yeah, you know ahead how, of me. <laughs> how, this is how morbid I am. I am fascinated by end of life. And so I've done some like just some light reading on end of life in like different countries and the United States does it all wrong. And like, you have to look to like some European countries, like a lot of European countries do end of life really well and it can really improve like your quality of end of life and stuff. Like we always go like, Oh, you know, does anybody ever go like, uh, you know, if I get to this point, just shoot me. Like that's not like an end of life plan. You gotta have like a plan. So I'm going to have a pretty elaborate plan. Yeah. All my, all my fascination with it has gotten me is like last week I was talking to the wife and was like, I think I'm going to get a retirement plan going. It's like, that was, <laughs> that was about as far as I got where I was like, Oh, I have life like a insurance? job. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. I was like, I should start looking into all those adult things that I don't completely understand. What's a Roth IRA again? Like I was just like, oh, <laughs> you know, I'm like sitting here. And yeah, the funny thing friendly. is, I was on a con- I was on a call with my boss Matt from Hollux, who's forty. We're eleven years apart in age, and he was mm-hmm. like, I, he he's the one who mentioned to me that I should start thinking about a retirement plan. And I was like, Do you have a retirement plan? And he was like, No, but I was just thinking about it. And I was like, Man, James would be a lot better off if he started now. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, thanks, buddy. God, I don't even want to think about that. I'm not, I'm not even going to go because I'm still <laughs> trying to figure out my student loans. Oh, me too. So Me too. I'm going to be paying <laughs> off my student loans. If I started a retirement plan now, I'd probably still be paying off my student loans when I was ready to retire and be like, ah, shit, I got to stick at it because I still owe 10000 on these stupid loans. Uh, I should have banked on Bernie a little harder than in the, in the primaries. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, deep down, mm-hmm. we I think we all collectively just hope for like a, a Fight Club final sequence moment with all student loan lenders. <laughs> just... Mm-hmm. We're just all <laughs> quietly praying for the day that they all collapse and the economy goes into turmoil, but our down, debt disappears. Down. Yeah. That picks, <laughs> that slow version of where is my mind starts playing and we're just <laughs> collectively happy. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm glad that we can laugh because I feel like the last month of our relationship, every time I've talked to you, one of us has been like, can you friggin' believe what's happening? <laughs> How are you calm right now? <laughs> I've been trying in recent days. I've been trying to uh, 
to accept it a little bit more, and uh, it's been helpful to some extent. Yes, I've been working with a therapist. <laughs> okay. A A K yeah, A K my my fiance. So <laughs> he's been like, oh yeah, you know, we should just try to accept it a little bit more. Mm. And so we've been accept. I've been practicing acceptance. <laughs> it's been hard. No, you know I, what? You know what? It's been great though. For it's been great for punk out funds because since Trump's been elected, we our donations have gone up, which has been like fantastic. <laughs> so there's one plus, one silver lining. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But it is. It has been interesting because I remember I talked to you. I don't know if it was the morning after the election. Maybe it was two days after the election. And I and like I entered our conversation the wrong way because I think I opened with like a Trump joke and you were just like not having it. Like you were still like, are you freaking are you were like, are you joking with me right now? Like, uh, And I remember walking away from the conversation like I think I've ruined my relationship with Michael because I approached this. I, I definitely walked in the wrong door this morning and I and right. I a fire and it was bad and but then you know the more i thought about it i was like you know i that's just my coping mechanism with anything awful is i'm just like isn't death hilarious and i get that to most people it's not and i'm like eh, no then but it gave me a moment of serious reflection and i was like but you had a right you you do and continue to have a right to be angry about it and i was like oh i, I went about this the wrong way so then when i was like oh maybe i'll have him back on the show i was like okay that gives me like a second chance to be like now i'm listening like now i'm now yeah I'm, you probably <laughs> <laughs> my my so like how i mourned the the destruction of america uh, was i woke up and well first of all i could not sleep the whole night of the election i was not able to fall asleep i woke up the next day i was in a daze i was like okay i'm just gonna go to work and just pretend like everything is fine and on the way to work which is like <laughs> from my bedroom to my desk because i work at home i started crying I sat down, started working, didn't cry for the rest of the day. Then at lunch, how pitiful is this? I'm walking to Subway because there's nothing else in the area that I, you know, that I can eat. And uh, I started crying again. And then I came home and then I was fine. So you probably caught me uh, in between the two cries with uh, your joke. Yeah, you were just you were just at you know, and after you get a good cry out, then you're just you're just so drained that it's just like uh, mm-hmm. hairpin trigger emotions. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of like you know the first time I watched Armageddon because we were talking about that a little earlier. Mm-hmm. Cried my eyes out as like yeah. a five year old. Well, I mean, how can you not? Bruce Willis sacrifices himself for young love. Spoiler Bruce alert! Willis. What a guy! <laughs> what a guy! Um, well, let me. So, what was the first meeting? I guess I don't know really how you operate punk out, but I assume that you have like regular meetings with your board. So like, what was the first, I guess, conversation amongst the punk out board post-election like? Uh, well, I mean, uh, so the first thing that I did, uh, well, first of all, like I get up pretty early in the morning. So it was, um, I kind of had a, I just wanted to give my, my team like a little message of like positiveness and, you know, the first reaction other than being like, super sad was like, I felt super motivated at the same time. Um, you know, I, I felt like, uh, you know, I felt all during the election itself as if, you know, I wanted Hillary to win so bad. And it's not that I was super invested in, in Hillary Clinton as the politician herself, but I was super invested in the idea of Trump not getting elected. Um, and, and, and to be frank, like I liked Bernie and I liked Hillary. Um, and I thought originally that Hillary had a better chance to win, but you know, all along the tea leaves just seemed off about the election. And so like, I was already sort of bracing myself for worst case scenario. Um, and so when, when the worst case scenario did happen, my first reaction was, you know, shock and, and, and sadness. But then I like, got really motivated. And so I just went to my team and I, you know, I said, guys, like, this is like the time now we have to kind of get active. This is why we exist. You know, this is why other organizations exist. Um, and so like, it was just kind of a, uh, an echoing of that sentiment and everybody sort of agreed um, for the most part, uh, you know, in my team and our discussions were very positive and very, very frank and obviously very emotional. But um, at the same time, you know, it was, it was time to get down to business. 
in, in sort of a way. And I guess it didn't kind of hit us. And then, and then it definitely did get <laughs> pretty sad, you know, a couple of days later when it was like, Oh shit, he is actually going to be the president. Uh, when that like really set in, then it got pretty sad. And then we kind of got back to work. Like as soon as, we started seeing the actual bills start coming in and, you know, in places like Texas um, in the days after the election, we saw anti LGBT bills actually, you know, start to be introduced. It kind of dawned on us, you know, you can sit around and be sad about these things or, um, and while you're doing that, your, your, uh, your enemies are actually going to be um, passing their bills. So, we've got to get up and we've got to do stuff. So we've been motivated since then. And like I said, like donations have been great, which is, it goes a really long way in a small organization like ours um, to, to helping us get the resources we need to really get our voice out there. Um, and so that's, you know, it's going to be an interesting four years, James. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. It's going to be a very interesting four years. Yeah. So as you're looking at it from, you know, the punk out perspective and your message and what you're trying to do, obviously I would say that there's, you know, now is like, it's kind of like a double edged sword in that, like there is now an even greater urgency for you to get your message out and for you to be doing what you're doing, despite the fact that the reason that it's more urgent is because things are like turn, taking a turn for the worse. Um, how do you, I guess, how do you look at it? Like, do you have a, like a three month, six month, 12 month plan? Are you looking at it as like, what, like what comes next for you? Like 2017 begins, you got 21 days to the inauguration. What is punk out's focus? Well, I think in a lot of ways, the election did sort of shift our focus and um, maybe narrow our focus a little bit more um, into, into more of the politics side. Um, obviously we have limitations on how political we can get, but when it comes to LGBT issues, we could be, we're pretty free as an organization to really hone in on particular issues in the LGBT community. And I think the election just sort of, you know, brought our, brought into focus the need to really, you know, take a look at these state level issues that are getting passed. And hidden in the election that was so terrible was the fact that, you know, the LGBT community proved that it can galvanize not only our community, but the greater populations to go against anti-LGBT legislation. You look in North Carolina and you have Pat McCrory, you know, losing his reelection bid, mainly because of his objection to allowing transgender people to use the bathroom of their choice. Um, and that cost him the election. And that's a really good sign. And so that was one positive and what I really took away from that is that is a successful model. We have a successful model that, that can work on the ground that other organizations have shown us, which is to focus on these specific state level issues and really galvanize populations and bring them together. Um, and so that's really where Punk Out's focus in 2017 is going to be, is to try to get our, our music community a little bit more honed in and focused on particular issues and putting the weight of our music community behind trying to address some of those issues on a state level. Um, and, you know, in my, I've talked to, to several uh, bands and musicians and, you know, bands and musicians, we're, we're going to see a lot more political uh, music, I think, coming out of our music community in the near future, which is going to be really awesome um, because a lot of these, a lot of these uh, musicians are really interested in getting more involved on the political side. And so we see an opportunity in 2017 as Punk Out to help align those, those musicians with causes um, and to get them set up and show them how they can best use their assets to help influence public policy, for instance. Um, so that's sort of what the, what the election itself did for our focus in 2017. So it definitely changed things um, and, and put things more into focus, which is, uh, you know, I consider that a positive Definitely. It, 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 it's frustrating because in the weeks since there's been so many debates about like, why, why did we miss this? Or why did the numbers tell us one thing and another thing happened? And I, I feel like it's unfair to say that 
for people to be like, well, there's this push that's like more equality or more acceptance and people don't like having the those ideas pushed on them. And this the Trump presidency is like a response to the demand for equality from certain groups. And I feel like that's I feel like that's a really uh, maybe an oversimplification of what pushes people in that direction. But I mean, ha ha have you seen those kind of arguments come across where they're like, well, there's you're trying to force these things on people and they don't want to accept them? Well, I, you know, I didn't actually think that the election of Donald Trump, um, you know, is a referendum on the idea of spreading equality. Um, I think that, it, you know, and I, I believe that if polling will back me up, if you look, um, if you ask Americans, you know, question by question, you know, do you support the right of transgender people to use the bathroom of their choice, for instance, you're going to get the majority who say yes, most Americans believe in equality. And that's just one example. But most Americans, when, when phrased in specific questioning like that, uh, you know, support equality. Um, I think the, the election itself was more of a referendum on, um, say, like more on economics than, than, say, social issues. But I know that, that some on some social crusaders on, on especially on the right in, recently, I think of like, you know, Milo Yiannopoulos and, and, and those likes, uh, you know, they, they've been kind of taking this uh, win by Donald Trump out of context. I don't think this was a, a referendum on, on, on spreading equality. Um, I think this was a referendum on, on the economy. But um, so I guess I don't necessarily buy the premise of your question, you know. Um, and I and I didn't expect you to. I mean, that was kind of where I was coming from with me because I, I've heard this argument made, and every time I'm like, I don't know. It just seems like an oversimplification to be like, well, people people don't want to accept this idea because I don't think that it comes down to that. I think that that's kind of a thing that's that's one of the things that people are blaming. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I mean, they're looking at what dominated the headlines before the election kind of kicked into full swing, and they're saying, well, this is a kickback to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look, think back on the election, like LGBT issues was not an issue that was discussed in the election. Um, it, it just wasn't. So, um, and a lot of social issues really weren't, you know, the, the focus of the election itself. Uh, so I don't, I don't buy it. I, I don't buy that, that, that this was a referendum on, on, social issues and a push for equality, because I think polling really does show um, that the majority of Americans, when questioned about it, will uh, support equality and do want equality. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, that that is it in my experience. You know, I I have a nice, you know, Midwestern mom that is about as uh, as conservative as you can get. So I, I have a lot of conversations with her that I try to extrapolate to like what it's like to deal with that whole base of people. And I, I never get the impression from her that she's against something. Sometimes I feel like she's confused or she doesn't feel like she completely understands certain you know ways of life or identities. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And I feel like there's a lot of education work to be done there. But it has kind of frustrated me to see in the fallout people being like, well, they don't understand this movement, mm -hmm. so therefore they're trying to prevent it. And I'm like, I don't that's mm -hmm. that's not what's happening. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't I, I agree with you there. I mean, I think it I think the, the biggest thing it, it is is ignorance and, um, and and not ignorance in a bad way. I mean, just ignorance in general. Um, and I think that if the one thing that this this uh, this election showed us was that we need to fix how we, we talk to people who disagree with us. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to find a way to converse with these with, with people. And this goes on both sides. But, you know, we as as liberals also have to take a look at the way we talk to folks we, who are conservative and see if we can make our conversations more constructive because we're not getting through um, to them. Our messages aren't getting through to them. And, and it just is, uh, it's frustrating to see. It's frustrating to see. I think we have to have a little bit more empathy for everybody. Yeah. Because, I mean, if we have the opportunity to educate somebody on an issue, you know, um, they're going to be way more receptive if you're respectful of their questions and respectful, you know, uh, of their confusions. Um, and, you know, because everybody learns things in different ways. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. Uh, maybe 2017 could be the year of empathy. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. We'll we can see. With, with, with Donald Trump, right? With Donald Trump leading, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. leading the way. 
you know, we we're, we said on a morning where they've announced that they're going to ban protesters from being uh, near the uh, anywhere near the inauguration. So yeah, empathy is totally. Oh, happening. Yeah, did are you, you not- going? I, I'm going. I'm going to go down, and, and uh, my fiance is coming down with me, and so are two of our friends. We're going to go down for that for the march, the women's march. Yeah, well, I was reading about it this morning. I don't know. It's a, it is a pretty cheap flight from here. It's one of those things where I f- I'm interested to see how protest culture evolves in 2017 because i waited throughout mm-hmm. 2015 and 2016 and the whole time i was like at one point some artist i kind of expected it to be against me but i was like someone is going to release like a, a protest song or anthem or album and mm-hmm. all of a sudden we're going to see this the swarm of new protest music that's going to motivate this younger generation that's like that complains from behind social media to actually act and it never happened but now that i feel like you know, the thing that I thought protest music was going to happen to prevent has actually come true. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're going to see like late wave protest music where it's like, oh, yeah. oh shit, we have to start protesting now. Now, I guess, I guess it is my responsibility. Um, yeah. We're gonna see that. I think, <laughs> well, we're gonna, I, think... I think it's going to actually come up in 2017. Yeah. I mean, I, we, we have bands. I think that some of the bands that may lead that March would be like, you know, like you said against me, but I think that, you know, Kevin Devine's always been, political and i think that he's going to continue to be political um i think a band like let live could really find their footing um in in wider audiences with their political stance as well i mean i i think that what a lot of people for what a lot of people forget is that the same folks who have been leading you know the the successes of the past you know decade or two of of liberalism still exist i mean you know, there's ups and downs in, in, in every time, and we're just in one of those down periods. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just more constructive to think on, on, I think, on the positive side. It's just more constructive in this instance. Um, but I, I think that I love when musicians get political. Um, I think that it, it's, you know, I, I advocate with punk out. You know, I want people to be out there. I want them to be loud. I want them to be, be talking about, you know, their issues uh, and what they care about. Um, because they have a platform and, and they, you know, I, I, I love the first amendment and I think you should be able to, you know, speak out on, on issues that you care about. And especially if, you know, they go to the benefit of, of, of folks and improving the lives of people. I absolutely agree with you. So let me ask you this, cause I don't want to keep you for too long. What, uh, what can I do or anyone else listening to this to kind of get involved in the punk out movement? Well, I mean, okay, so the biggest thing for us is definitely engaging on social media because that's where, where that's where the national conversation is happening about this, it's, you know, what's going on. I think everybody has to be more engaging on, on social media um, and, you know, raise awareness for Punk Out, raise awareness for other organizations that you support, um, show, you know, what you stand for. Um, because I think, you know, the majority of people don't stand for uh, a lot of the things that the man who's going to be leading this country stands for. And I think we just have to make sure that everybody knows that, that there is, you know, an opposition to um, the perception right now that the rest of the world has about us as Americans. And one of the ways we can do that is through supporting our, our favorite organizations and showing them some love on social media. Um, other ways that you can really get involved with Talk Out uh, you know, we do a lot of snack drives. Uh, we're going to have a ton of great snack drives. Uh, we're going to be partnering with a bunch of bands uh, in 2017. Um, we just finished up three uh, straight snack drives with the Wonder Years uh, in three different cities, uh, which went fantastic. So we're hoping to do some more with them next year um, and, and uh, with other bands as well, well where we collect food um, and other resources for local LGBT youth centers. Um, so, you know, support local snack drives and food drives and food banks, um, and come out to one of our shows, which would be fantastic as well. And I think we'll have a benefit show next year. That should be interesting in Philly. We haven't done one of those yet. And, uh, we think we want to make it a big thing. So we're hoping to do something like that next year as well. If I wanted to financially contribute to Punk Out, is that tax deductible? Oh my God, totally. Yeah. We're registered 501c3. There you yeah, go. When you, uh, uh, oh, oh yeah, that's what I always say. Come on, we're tax deductible. It's exciting. 
Uh, get, yeah. So when you don't, if you can go to our website and donate to us, uh, you'll get a uh, you'll get a receipt with our with our tax ID, and you just put that on your taxes, and that is tax deductible, and that's how it's done. And you'll get a nice little receipt. So yeah, absolutely. We love all of our. So we're self funded. Uh, we are going to dabble in some grants this year. Um, but right now we are we are self funded, and uh, every bit helps us with everything that we do and getting resources out to different cities. So we can help other LGBT youth centers. Um, it always goes so far. So, yeah. Well, that makes me happy to hear. How is uh, life outside the battlefield? Everything going well? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's happening with me? Uh, getting married. That's getting fun. married. That's exciting. Yeah. Is that yeah. happening next year? You know how that goes. Yes, that happens in October. Okay. October 2017. Yeah. So we're getting a... And, the biggest thing in my life right now, James, is trying to find a DJ because I'm so picky about the music that can be played at okay. this wedding that I need to like, handpick a DJ, and it's been the hardest thing that I've ever tried. I'm like looking everywhere. I send emails. I have like a whole list of songs you're not allowed to play. <laughs> and you're dead set on having a DJ and not just a, like a playlist and a nice sound system. Uh, I may do that. I may do that. That's what we did. It was a lot easier than finding a DJ that didn't suck. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking that may be the way to go because I'm going to be so picky about it anyway. Plus, then you can make like we had like I had like a like a dinner playlist and a dance playlist. And we had, you know, like we could break up the night into certain yeah. sec sections. I got real nerdy about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I totally I am right there with you. I'm going to definitely do that. Um, but I, I was the one thing I was thinking about that who's going to like MC the night, you know what I mean? I want somebody to be MCing. Well, I actually had punk out, uh, punk out board member Ash Ashley was a uh, was our host for our wedding. That's what we did. Oh, was she really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, we played awesome. music, and then randomly, when we needed like food announced or speeches, Ashley would take the mic and kind of guide the night, and then she would hand it off to whoever needed to talk. Oh, that's not a bad idea. And Maybe she's I'll a friend, well, so I can't... there's no money there. I know, yeah, but I don't want a friend working my wedding. Yeah, that's the thing. But, but it's nice because, like, you know, I had the same thought, but then you're like, well, I guess technically if you're a part of the wedding party, you're kind of working my wedding because you got to be in the photos, you've got to, like, shake hands with a whole bunch of family you don't actually know, and you're, like, a part <laughs> of this thing. So, like, a host is just, like, another best man, best woman, and you're just saying, like, these mm -hmm. are the people that represent what matters most in my life. I'll be your I host do. if you need a host. I'll, I'll fly down, <laughs> rock a mic. Uh, I'll bring the puppy or one of the cats if you need an animal there. <laughs> oh no, we have we have plenty of we have two cats right now, and we're getting a fake. Mm. Matt Matt's uh, birthday. Matt my uh, my fiance's birthday was yesterday, and so I bought him. He really wants a snake, and so we're going snake shopping tomorrow. But I bought him all of the snake like habitats. So we're really excited about getting the snake here. I don't think the kitties are excited about the snake. They don't know about the snake yet. Um, but we're excited for the snake. I love that. Ne <laughs> never a dull moment in your life, my friend. No. And we're, did I tell you when we're getting married? We're getting married at um, at the the home of Sears Robach. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. He built this mansion in the early 1900s. Well, late 1800s, early 1900s. And when he died, he bequeathed it to a local art gallery. And the art gallery then became like an art foundation. And so now it's an, his, his old mansion is an art museum. And so, yeah, we, we rented it out. It's going to be so much fun. Well, that is awesome. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> how, are you, how are you and the wife doing? We're good. We're good. It's been a while since somebody asked me on the show. No, we're, we're, we're good. It's, it's, it's weird. I was actually talking to somebody about it the other day because I was making a joke. They announced this Warped Tour cruise and I was texting with a photographer friend of mine and I was like, that just sounds like a, like an excuse to get drunk and cause all sorts of trouble for four days in a row. And uh, <laughs> they texted me back and he's like, yeah, and you can't partake in any of it now. And I was like, you know, you know, that, 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 that thought does go through my head sometimes where it's like, oh man, that just sounds like a shit faced party time. And I'm like, ah, it's not really, I'm not that guy anymore. Cause it's, and, uh, and I was telling him, I was like, you know, there's a there's like a split second where your brain goes like oh yeah but then the rest of you goes like oh yeah but i don't i don't really care <laughs> like you know that I, I kind of like this more this is a lot nicer once you get into the groove of it it's like oh this is a lot yeah. more comfortable and maybe it's not 
maybe it's not a drunk night I don't remember every every weekend, but uh, I remember a lot of good things instead. It's kind of nice. It's kind of nice to just you know Dude, that 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 what about that that warped torture is though? What about that? <laughs> it's uh, come on, it's a mess. Can, can you imagine? I are you gonna do it? No, <laughs> I've had I've had three people offer me a space in a hotel in in a cabin. <laughs> It's no, no. That sounds hilarious. I would not do that. The last, like, I love, I love Warp Tour. Obviously, grew up on Warp Tour, but like the idea of being stuck on a ship with everybody on <laughs> Warp Tour does not sound appealing to me at all. Like, I'm just not interested in that. <laughs> yeah, no, and I'm just not that guy who's like, I want to party till four a.m. on Warp Tour culture every day for that long. yeah and i've been yeah. on warp tour like i've went on warp tour and did the after party thing every night for like weeks on end and i just have no desire to like do that on the high seas it's just, <laughs> the do you think it do you think it's going to be successful do you think it's going to work my biggest thing is the cost i mean like if if you buy the cheapest possible one you have to have four people to your room and even with taxes and fees it turns out to be like a thousand dollars before flights before ubers to and from the air it's like a fourteen hundred dollar investment at the I cheapest know, and, and, and is that like the warp tour crowd you know yeah it's just i mean and i'm in in by Warped Tour crowd, you mean you and me, because we're like in our 20s, we have jobs that can afford to pay for that kind of thing, in theory. In theory, we have jobs <laughs> that can afford to pay for that thing. But James, like, I run a non-profit. I don't know, yeah. I'm not swimming in cash to go on to the... <laughs> no, I mean, my wife and I, we actually wanted to go on the Impractical Jokers cruise. It's similarly priced, and we couldn't afford it. And I was so I saw this thing for uh, for Warp Tour, and we both have full-time jobs and health insurance and all that, all that things that make us mm-hmm. adults, but we were both just like... I don't know if it's wor- worth it. And for this Warp Tour thing, I'm like, there's 10 bands announced now, but none of them cost more than $30 to see in concert. So that's like 300 bucks. Yeah. So that, there's 300 Yeah, so I would think about it too. I was like, I love the starting line and all. I mean, they're amazing, right? They're from my own town. Like, of course, love the starting line. I could not imagine paying that much money to go see them on a, on a ship. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you're like, okay, so I'm paying for the experience. And what is the experience after we remove, if we take $300 out, so then $700 has to be the experience. And like, I like Warp Tour, but I hate Warp Tour crowds. Like, I hate, like, like let's, let's all, like, outside of my industry friends, everyone else that goes to Warp Tour, I eventually end up being like, I wish you weren't here. Um, yeah, the, the just, beauty of Warp Tour is that you can fit in all those bands into one day. Yeah. And then you can leave. <laughs> then and, you're done. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm sure they'll add a few more big bands, but usually with a lot of cruises, you kind of come out guns blazing with your biggest act. So like, if they announce another band that's like a big band, I think like yeah. you're gonna see like a Taking Back Sunday. There's another. That's a thirty dollar band. That's gonna be how I define this cruise. It's a thirty dollar cruise. All these bands are thirty dollar bands. So yeah. unless you have like a hundred of them. You aren't going to make me feel like I'm getting a bargain for my thousand dollars because otherwise I'm just I'm paying you to sweat on a boat and go to Warp Tour. Not no. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't Paramore do a, a cruise? Yeah, the pair. I think it's called a Paracruise. You got to pun it. They're all punny. It's like Paracruise, Weezer Cruise. Oh yeah, well, yeah, you yeah. know I reject puns. I reject puns on the most basic level, so <laughs> I will never accept that. But I, you know what? And I do love Haley though. She's she is amazing. But. Uh, yeah, I, I don't even know if I would do it as Paramore. It's, it's and there's an argument, idea. there's an argument to be made that a pair, the, I think it's actually called Parahoy, like uh, Ahoy, Parahoy. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that is amazing. And I hate it at the same time. <laughs> I think, I think the thing is though, there's an argument to be made that Parahoy already is Warped Tour at Sea. Like the, the, yeah. the Paramore, Newfound Glory and a whole bunch of smaller pop punk bands. Like, that's Warped Tour at Sea, so this is just another version of that without the idea that... Like, the cool thing about most theme cruises is if you go on the 311 cruise, it's like mm-hmm. 2,000 311 fans. And that's cool because everyone there likes the same band, but the idea of a Warped Tour cruise is like 100 Good Charlotte fans, 100 Starting Line fans, mm-hmm. and it's not a community unless you go about the idea yeah. that like everyone loves all those bands and based on the reactions to the in- initial list like i don't know anyone that other than myself that's like i love real big fish 303 and the starting line yeah so i yeah i totally agree there i just can't see i don't know i just i think it's yeah, missing I mean, they're, the idea they're, they're smart people right Ken's yeah. a smart guy i'm sure he, i'm sure he knows i'm sure he knows what's what's going on 
There I, has to be, there, you know, there has to be a rhyme to this reason. But I will bet you almost anything that if we if, if we could watch all of the Groupons throughout America, there will be a Groupon for the Warped Tour cruise. I've seen it done for bigger cruises. I've seen it done for like the New Kids on the Block cruise and other cruises that are actually really successful and an annual event. So I would imagine that you'll see some discounted Warp Tour tickets because you got to sell like you have to hit a certain number to even let the cruise like leave the dock. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I just don't well, know you that know, you can do it otherwise. Because if you, know you don't, a lot of, you know a lot. Of, you know a lot about. Uh, I worked for a company that cruises. sponsored a tour once, but what happens is if you undersell the cruise, what'll happen is that they'll do a Groupon that's unrelated to the themed cruise, and you'll end up with like a boat that's half filled with people that are there for the Warp Tour cruise and half filled with just like families looking for a cheap cruise. <laughs> and that was the other thing i was like well if, if people our age aren't going on the warp tour cruise then is it just going to be a whole bunch of like families with like angsty emo kids and then parents who are like what the hell are we doing here can you imagine like if like if icp did a, did a cruise exactly and, like, only halfway sold out and mm -hmm. then you just have these unsuspecting families on this cruise with icp fans yeah. oh my god that'd be amazing i also had the thought where i was like this cruise wouldn't work 10 years ago because 10 years ago war tour was like littered in like the emo movement we all had long bangs and we all hated the sunshine so the idea of like four days mm -hmm. at sea in the heat sounds it still sounds awful to me because my inner emo kid's like now nah, i prefer the darkness like how about we just do exactly it? like we're all pale and we don't yeah. want to be near the sun it sounds wanna... like the... all the yeah. people who go to wow. warp tour in a bikini are the worst people like if you're in a if you're in a swim trunks with no shirt or you're in a bikini at warp tour you're the people that i try to avoid the most so like why would i go on a boat that's just you that's just filled with you yeah <laughs> <laughs> and we've all met them we've all seen the guys and gals in like swimsuits in uh in parking lots because that's what it is mm -hmm. and now they're on oh scene. god yeah 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 see that's that's how i picture mm -hmm. it it's like all of the worst people i know i know yeah you, uh, well i'm sure it's gonna be a blast for anybody who goes yeah but i mean if they offered you and me like to share a cabin i'd be like in i'd be like oh, i'll go like if someone offers me a spot i'll go but i'm not i'm just not spending <laughs> the thousand dollars <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I feel like James and Mike go to Warp Tour Cruise and make a great podcast. <laughs> oh, yes. There would have to be a lot of alcohol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a cruise, right? It's like, a that's cruise. That's how it works. And it's so expensive. Is it all inclusive? Cruises. No. <laughs> that's the worst part is, it's like, we didn't even talk about it. you got to also buy alcohol once you're on the boat. Uh, I, I know. And I would need a lot of alcohol. Yeah, we all would. So. <laughs> um but all right man i'm gonna let you join the day i have to like leave for the airport in a little bit and i gotta get this podcast out or else i would talk to you for yep hours. well you have a safe flight okay man yeah i mean this is like my i'm tired of flying but that's a whole nother conversation this has been a this has been a year of flights for me so this is my yeah, last one i know you're always flying everywhere yeah 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 so this is it this is it uh and then you're episode 99 so you're the last person before we hit three digits how exciting yeah, Who's your exciting. big three digits? Can you tell me who your three digits Oh, yeah. Well, it's just Matt, the founder of Holix, which is a big deal for me because he hates to talk. Like, he hates to talk oh, about sweet. himself, so I'm going to well, get him to talk about himself. Nice. <laughs> even, when I, even when I asked him to come on the show to do it, I was like, people want you to do the show. You should come on. We'll just have a conversation. He was like, I don't think I have anything interesting to say, but I'll talk about... He, like, listed four things, and I was like, you obviously don't understand how this works. <laughs> like, I was like, we're just going to... Don't worry about saying interesting things. Like, please don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but all right, this well, is gonna be out soon. Last, thank you. Last thing, how do people stay up with you or Punk Out online? Like, what are hit, hit us with the socials? Uh, punk Out LGBT. So you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I think those are the three that we do. Yeah, uh, we're really trying to drive and reach our 2016 goal on our Facebook. So if you can go there and like it, that would be a huge help to us. All right. Well, I wish you the best, my right. friend. Thanks, man. Have a safe flight and, and uh, good luck, okay? You're great. Yes, sir, man. I'll talk to you soon. Have a great weekend. Okay. Yeah. Bye.